Night of Champions 2023 here on Tap Out Talk. I'm your host, Brian, the Hype Ballard, and I'm back with all the action. We're going to get in live from the Superdome in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, a night that could shape the future of the WWE with three main events. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but more importantly, I'm also going to talk about a huge missed opportunity by the WWE tonight. And we're going to go over that. I'm going to give you what they should have done by the end of this show. Without further ado, let's get in. All right, and the show will kick off, everyone, with none other than Night of Champions. We get a lot of fireworks. We get a lot of pyro. But then you know what we get? We get the World championship heavyweight championship match to start and kick off the show and i gotta say i was a little uh, shocked that the wwe went this route this is a brand new championship i feel like this could have main invented the show now by the end of the night i'll tell you i do understand why the wwe chose story over a new title but that could be a little bit of a mistake so here's my take This is a new title. You did a really great job with setting it up with a special tournament leading up to the premium live event. I actually like the triple threat match. I like the build and the tournament style leading up to this championship. I like the participants. I like the fact that you left it with the indie darling of the TNA Impact, AJ Styles, who represents classic doing it old school way of wrestling. And then you got Seth Rollins, the WWE made star. I like that they kind of hit those little outliers and not the story, but kind of what we know as fans. What I didn't like is a new title could have main evented a Night of Champions pay-per-view where it was basically turned from a King of the Ring into this for this title. And this title opened up the match. You couldn't have gave a main event slot to. Now granted, I'm not going to be mad at the WWE for the route they went because they did put Roman and the Usos on the main event. But, you know, we've seen that before. But either way, I was pleased with the show tonight. I was pleased with a lot of what we did. So let's talk about it a little bit. This match comes out and Seth Rollins is just so over with this crowd. AJ Styles is a fan favorite too. So they take their time and then Styles, basically they get started and then Styles sends them to the apron. And it's a little early for the phenomenal forearm, but Styles rolls out of the headlock. But Rollins is right back with a kick to a head takeover. Back up and Styles drives him into the corner for some shoulders to the ribs, a chin lock that doesn't last long. And Rollins is back down with spiral in the middle of the turnbuckle. But Styles is right back at it with a suplex into the corner and the phenomenal blitz. A middle rope, a moonsault into a reverse DDT. Plants Rollins again and he's right back up on the buckle bomb. The frog splash gives Rollins the two, but the pedigree is reversed into an enziguri. With nothing else really working out here, Styles loads up at the Super Styles Clash from the top of the rope. But Rollins slips out of it and avoids and hits quite a bit of pain in this situation. I will say, AJ Styles and the Styles Clash, does it ever work in the WWE? I don't you know, think I can think of times where it's actually successfully helped him win a big time main event match. So, instead, Rollins puts him on the top for a reverse superplex into a reverse um, sit-out superplex for a one and a two. The Phoenix Splash misses and they fight to the apron where Styles hits a brain buster to knock Rollins just off. Then back in, Styles tries the phenomenal forearm instead of actually covering him. But Rollins breaks it up and sends him to the back with the floor. The suicide dive hits Styles, but Rollins comes up with a favoring his knee. And you do think at one moment that Rollins Might legitimately be hurt here. The way he landed, it did look a little painful. Well, they get back in the ring again, and Styles grabs the calf crusher, but Rollins grabs a choke for the escape. Styles kicks away, and he has to duck the Pele. Ooh, been a while since we've seen the Pele. But Rollins 
hits a pedigree, and it's countered into uh, just a one from Styles for two. And as Styles is bleeding from the head a bit at this point in the match, the phenomenal forearm is super kick. Boom! Out of nowhere in the air. But the knee gives out on the stomp to follow up on that super kick. And then the knee, then again, he gets up and he perseveres through. And Rollins hits the pedigree and followed by a stomp at the 20 minute and 37 second mark. Rollins for the one, the two, and the three. After the match, Seth Rollins is awarded this new World Heavyweight Championship by none other than his former mentor, Triple H himself. And it just does take you back to their feud and back to their um, the days where he did mentor Seth Rollins in his first championship run. So it is kind of a special moment. It took me back a couple years. But at the end of this match, yeah, it was the right call, you guys. Seth Rollins holding this new, and that is a nice-looking title. Look at that title. That's a nice title. So, I love that looking at the modern classic throwback design. This might be one of my favorite titles in the WWE right now. But, you know, tell me which one is your favorite right now, because I do like this design. Is there another one that you guys like? Let me know. But, ultimately, this is Seth Rollins. He is so over with the crowd. They're singing his song. And you know what? They're going to be singing that tune on Monday Night Raw as he comes out to that championship. And I'm looking forward to a Monday Night Raw in the Rollins era to see what he can do with that in a modern day champion. We move on to our next matchup. And this is a matchup of the veteran Trish Stratus. Fresh off her heel turn against the man, Becky Lynch. Not big time Bex this time. Becky, you know, they get right at it in the ring. This has been building up for a while, but Becky doesn't wait long and charges at Trish as the fight heads out right to the outside. Trish gets a shot of her own and he takes it over, including a kick to the ribs back inside. After Trish thanks herself a bit, says, thank you, thank you. Trish snaps off a tornado DDT for a one and a two. The reverse chin lock goes after for a bit, but Trish hammers away. The neckbreaker gives Trish a two count, but Becky fires up and starts striking away. Becky's leg drop in the back of the neck gets a one and a two, but Trish gets in another shot to cut all her off. Not an overall stratosphere then she connects with at this point, only to have a stratisfaction broken up. Becky hits the diamond dust in the middle of the rope leg drop but Trish breaks up the man handle slam. And then the Boston Crab is out of the corner and it just doesn't work this time. And Trish scores with the chick kick for the one and the two. And then there's a disarmor goes on, but Trish is just too close to the ropes and she grabs him in the nick at the time. Becky manages the man handle slam, but again, those ropes get in the way and Trish gets out of trouble again. And she sends her to the outside. And all of a sudden, from under the ring, we get a mystery person appearing. And it takes us a little bit to figure out. It's Zoe Stark, fresh from NXT. Remember, she was drafted recently to the main roster. And she connects with the Z360. And she throws Becky back into the ring for a stratisfaction that connects. And a finish for a one, a two, and a three. And it's at about the 14 minute, 15 minute mark of this matchup and at this point this does go through and advances the story for us now the tire because remember we're in Saudi Arabia fun fact I think this is the most clothing that Trish Stratus has wore ever in her WWE career in a match so you got Becky Lynch with the Kill Bill style attire always a popular favorite of mine but again Trish uh, definitely I don't think she's wore this many clothes in a match but we actually have, you know, Trish and Zoe Stark. And I like the match because it does one thing. It continues the story, but it doesn't have to continue just with Trish only. So Becky can now have a little bit of a feud with Zoe Stark. And this is a great way for Zoe Stark to give a little bit of muscle to Trish Stratus. Also, other thought, Trish Stratus can still wrestle. I seen it at Mania, and I seen it here tonight. 
and if she is a veteran that can still go in the ring, and I know she's one of my all-time crushes. Wait, did I say that? I mean favorites. So, without further ado, let's go on to our next matchup, which was the Intercontinental Championship. Again, this is Night of Champions, right? We gotta have more title matches. So, we get this match off right away. It's the hometown favorite, Ali versus Gunther. Gunther gets introduced by Imperium, and then he is defending this title. Um, Ali basically kicks away, and there's a leg to start. Um, he kicks away at Gunther's leg, and he has to start and fights out with an early sleeper. There's some running drop kicks. There's a stagger Gunther, and he's like chopping a big red oak tree. But he is back with a slam, and the pace slows a little as Gunther chops and pounds Ali down to the ground with a brutalizing punch. Um, Gunther gets some, you know, things from the commentary team tonight saying, making comparisons to Bruno San Martino and a little bit of how he is like Bruno in a sense. So it's great, you know, minimal storytelling to get some seeds planted in our head about what Gunther's meant to be. So, Gunther slows the pace again, like I said. Ali gets down, he sets up for a Boston Crab. Ali kicks out, and he's sent to the apron where Gunther kicks him out to the floor. Back in, Gunther chops away, but Ali fires off some desperation shots of his own. Gunther catches him up top, and he gets knocked down. He sets up for a 450 splash for a near fall, but a hard clothesline gives Gunther a two. So he tells Ali he doesn't belong. And then the power bomb is countered into the kick into the head. There's a tornado DDT plants Gunther. There's a 450 that's missed at this time though. And then Gunther drop kicks him into the corner. And that's just enough to set him up for the power bomb and a one and a two and a three. And Gunther retains at the eight minute mark of this matchup. So this was what I wanted to see in some of these matches. I like Gunther being dominant over Ali. There's no world where Mustafa Ali beats Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship. He's too fast, he's too hot, he's too furious, and he's ready to stamp the record books with becoming the longest Intercontinental Champion in WWE history. Fun fact, he's got two guys that he's got to leapfrog for that title still. That's Randy Macho Man Savage, and he's got to also leapfrog the Honky Tonk Man at 453 days, and Gunther is well on his way. Great matchup, effective. You've seen the aggression in Gunther throughout the matchup, and you believe that he's the real deal. And I'm telling you, the WWE is building him up so right with the Royal Rumble this year, and then following that up with this strong Intercontinental title push. This feels old school. Gunther has an old school vibe to him, and it's gonna pay off in the future, I promise. Let's move on. So this one was my shocker of the night. The thing that we wanted to happen that nobody thought would go down, the Raw Women's Championship. Belair is defending and she gets taken down in the matchup against Asuka. Asuka hammers away, but Belair reverses it and she just fights right back. Some stomps to the face and then she keeps Belair in trouble, but a drop kick puts Asuka in the apron. The handspring kick to the head sends Asuka to the outside where she sends Belair into the steps. Back in and Asuka kicks her in the face and driving a boot into Belair's head. There's a, more stomping as Belair is troubled and Asuka grabs the arm bar to mix it up a little bit. And then we go on, there's a comeback that's included with a standing moonsault, but Asuka kicks her off the top. There's a missile drop kick that gives Asuka a one and a two. We hit a Fujiwari armbar with that, but it's just broken up and Belair plants her with a spine buster for a one and a two. Asuka lock is broken up when they trade roll-ups for two pins on each other. And then they head outside and Asuka's being sent to the steps. They're fighting, they're brawling, and they're getting a little crazy. Allowing Belair to hammer away back inside. And it's the KOD, the kiss of death, is countered into the cross arm bar, but Belair rolls out and power bombs her down. Asuka bails to the ropes for desperation. She sprays the mist on her with her own fingers. So Asuka basically sprays the mist on to her fingers. And then back in, Asuka rubs the mist in Belair's eyes as she's up in the kiss of death, setting up the kick to the back of the head. And one, two, and three, Asuka is your new Raw Women's Championship at that 14 minute and 50 second mark. And I was so delighted 
fucking shocked and surprised at this. I shouldn't be. Asuka's a legitimate champion. But you want to know what? I see this, and I see that Asuka is finally champion in WWE. And there's a lot of directions we can go with this now. There's a lot of ways we can go with this. How would you guys like to see an Asuka versus, oh, I don't know, Io Sky at SummerSlam? That would be an interesting matchup. Asuka versus Io Sky. Book it. So, Asuka gets champion. But the more important story here is, I've been saying it forever. Bianca Belair's championship and career was saved tonight with this loss. The John Cena effect will be over for her now. I want to see what she can do on her own without the title, without the championship. And I, it is going to help her in the long term by not having that title. It was wearing thin and she was getting stale. The WWE corrected their mistake that they made it WrestleMania by giving this title to Asuka because nobody's ready for Asuka. Let's move on. And before we do, I just want to say thank you guys on Twitter. And thank you guys for like, sharing, and subscribing here on Tap Out Talk. Also, we're doing some great things over at thefansofprowrestling.com on the Wrestling Fans Inside Podcast with my teammates, Will, John, Heather, Carlos. You guys know who you are. And so many more out there in the world of wrestling. I appreciate each and every one of you and talking with you about this stuff. It makes me energized. Speaking of energy, let's get on to the SmackDown Women's Championship that follows immediately. So, this one is Natalya versus Rhea Ripley, fresh off of WrestleMania main eventing, right? And Rhea Ripley with um, Dominic Mysterio, she's defending, and an early Dominic distraction lets Ripley jump her and start the attack quickly. Ripley sends her face first into the announcer's table and then steps in and is beating on her early. There's then a riptide, and she retains at the one minute and four second mark. That's right, you guys. One, two, three, and it's over for Natalia. And all right, you know what? Natalia is the seasoned veteran, and like I said, she's always a bridesmaid and never a bride, meaning she's never the champion in this case, right? She's in that modern era, and she's passing the torch. They needed somebody for Rhea to dominate at a big pay-per-view and a title defense, and they gave it to her. And you know what I like about this match? It didn't outstay its welcome. That's what I enjoy the fact. I like when a champion's supposed to be dominant. They need to be dominant. See Gunther tonight. See Rhea Ripley. Now, some can argue that this was not a pay-per-view, sorry, premium live event, Saudi Arabia worthy to be a big match situation at Night of Champions. That's a fair point. This is a Monday Night Raw story progressor, right? We don't know where it goes from here. It might be a one and done. But, I don't know, Natalia looked pretty beat up. Maybe we go with a Natalia retirement angle here. Maybe that's a route we can take. Time will surely tell. And speaking of time, it's time for the second of the triple main event as they're marketing it, right? It's Cody in the return match against Brock Lesnar. If you remember last month at Backlash, Cody Rhodes got the one, two, three with a quick, we're gonna call it a roll up, but it wasn't a roll up. It was like a reverse flipped pit in Puerto Rico. So this time Cody's coming down with a broken arm Due to the buildup for this match, he broke his arm. Brock Lesnar broke his arm in a fit of rage. They go a, you know, a little bit skeptical to start, but until Lesnar starts snapping off belly to belly suplexes, Cody manages to knock him to the outside though, and there's a suicide dive. And Cody's looking strong here, back in, and there's a top ropes axe handle that hits Lesnar. I love the top ropes axe handle, followed by a pair of crossroads, a third counter into a Kimura though. And Rhodes is in big trouble. Rhodes stacks him up for a two. And he tries to do almost the same thing he did last month, but he just can't get out of this thing. Lesnar rolls him over, and he's sitting on Rhodes, who can't make it to the rope. The referee raises Cody arm, but he's still in it. He's still fighting, and he just won't give up. He's a Rhodes. Only to have Lesnar pull him closer into the middle, and somehow Cody turns it around and makes it to the ropes this time. And he's a fighting Rhodes, leaving Lesnar stunned. Another crossroads 
gets another one and a two. And then they're both just crazy and exhausted in this matchup. Lesnar's starting to get red. It's time to hit take this home. Cody hits him with the cast. He's realized he can use it as a weapon. And he gets pulled into the F5 for the one and the two. But then the Kimura goes on and Cody is fighting, fighting. And he passes out and the referee stoppage is the result of the match. Brock Lesnar wins due to referee stoppage at the nine minute and 36 second mark. And that was the rematch. It's a great way to advance the story. Um, it didn't make Cody Rhodes look weak tonight. I like that. It makes, the storyline makes Cody suffer. I like that. Every good hero has to have a journey of suffering in order to rise to the top. I like what they're doing with Brock and Cody. I'm not going to lie. Um, I said before on Wrestling Fans Insight that this would have to be maybe a two match. A one and a two, right? But not everything needs to be a three match. But after I seen the storytelling here, I was like, okay, let's bring on the third match. My question is, let's wait a little bit. I don't know if it needs to be a money in the bank. Let's give Cody some time to heal. And maybe the payoff match is Brock and Cody at SummerSlam. Or maybe, as you guys alluded to, it's Brock and Cody. Um, not Brock and Cody, but Cody and Roman at SummerSlam. Time will tell. And speaking of Roman, let's get into our main event of the evening. The undisputed tag team championships of the world. So, we've got Solo Sokoa and Roman Reigns doing what the Usos could not do at Mania and getting their titles back from Sammy and Kevin. Zayn and Owens, they're the defending champions here as Paul Heyman and Sammy um, basically handle the introduction. So Paul Heyman handles the introductions for the bloodline. Sammy Zayn handles the introductions in Arabic in front of Saudi Arabia for basically a huge hometown crowd pop. Owens and Reigns start, but it's more off to Zayn before anything really just gets going. Then more staring ensues as the fans are just all excited for this match. And I tell you, they got Sammy in their hearts and in their minds um, for all of this, really. Reigns tags Sokoa in, and then we get our first contact in about four minutes into the match, maybe. Zayn sends him into the corner and hits a few chops, which doesn't leave Reigns very happy at all with the result. An elbow to the face, and there's more Reigns, so you know it's basically just setting off to Owens. Some chops back, uh, kicks a, a Solo Sokoa back, but it's back to Zayn off through a blind tag for a drop toe hold. Reigns comes in for a cheap shot to Owens, and then quickly heads back to the floor. Back in, Sokoa drops a headbutt on Zayn before it's back to Reigns and Pace slows down just a little bit. Zayn chops away, but is dropped with a single shot. Reigns says, you think you're the nature boy now? That was a great line. I actually like the taunting by Roman. He does a good job with it. Afterwards, Owens chases off uh, Sokoa. Reigns slowly pounds Zayn down again, and Sokoa comes back in, and we hit a nerve hold. They head outside again, and Sokoa is getting down, uh, but being fine enough to cut Zane off. A Tornado DDT is enough to drop Sokoa, allowing the double tag to Owens and Reigns. Owens cleans house, and he knocks Reigns off for a blacksmith, but Sokoa cuts him off. Reigns hits a clothesline, but he hits a sit-out powerbomb, and Owens' frog splash hits for a one and a two, but he can't get up. The stunner is broken up by a Superman punch. It gives Reigns a one and a two. Um, another stunner connects, but Reigns bounces off the ropes and he hits the spear before falling just plain down. The double tag brings in Zayn to the hammer on Sokoa, setting up a big flip dive to the drop to the floor. The blue thunder bomb it gets back inside, but a haluva kick is cut off with a super kick. Zayn is basically ready to go to a suplex in the corner so the haluva kick can't connect. With that, Reigns is making the save. Reigns hammers away and loads up on a spear, but he takes out the referee by mistake and he's looking worried. Owens is back in to jump in on Reigns and they head to the outside for a whip into the steps. And here come none other than the Usos, who are not supposed to be here by order of their tribal chief. Those defiant twins them. They go, they jump Owens in a pair of super kicks. They rock Zane, but they double super kick 
instead of hitting the opponent, he they accidentally hit Sokoa and he stumbles to the outside. Rain sees what happens. He gets angry. And he really isn't happy. He gets in the ring and he yells at Jimmy and Jay. And then, out of nowhere, it's Jimmy that super kicks. Not Jay. Jimmy Uso super kicks him. Dre, Jay is screaming at Jimmy and he says, What are you what'd you do, Jimmy? What are you doing? He kicks reins. Jimmy looks at Jay. And he says, it's you and me now. I'm your brother. I'm going to do something that you should have done a long time ago. And he super kicks Roman again while he's on his knees, knocking him flat to the ground with that sweet chin music. Dave goes towards Reigns, but Jimmy then gets out. So uh, he can do barely anything. And then Sokoa's back up, but it's a stunner from Sami Zayn and a haluva kick for a, a three. And there's a second referee that comes in about the 26 minute mark. This match is over. Here's the aftermath on this one. After the kick, Jimmy and Jay are at the top of the ramp. Jimmy's looking pleased. Jimmy's freed his family from Roman. Jay's looking worried. He had the same mannerisms he had at the Royal Rumble when Sami Zayn turned on Roman. Very confused. The question is, what will Jay do? Good storytelling. He's got to back his brother, right? We all were thinking it was going to be Jay that helped break up the bloodline. But it was Jimmy. What did you do, Jimmy? I'm happy with this. I actually like being surprised that it was Jimmy. We teased it, right? But none of us really thought Jimmy was following through on this. So great Swerve storytelling by the WWE as Roman's looking distraught at ringside. You got the championships with Sammy and Kevin, and they're saying you never got these. You're never getting these. And that's when we go off the air for Night of Champions. A broken down bloodline. And you know what? The WWE main evented with a really good main event storytelling aspect. The match was decent, it was good. But the storytelling was great. And we went from good to great tonight. Um, so, yeah. I can't complain with what we ended with in Saudi Arabia at Night of Champions. So, I definitely got to say, uh, I was pleasantly surprised in going into the show. Me and the team over there at Wrestling, uh, fans of Wrestling.com, we were talking about this. And I was like, this to me is the most unpredictable match that I want to see what's going on. I said this is going to be the thing that's going to break everything down and push everything for the future where we're going. And now we know the breaking up of the bloodline is imminent. And we're going to get the Usos. But I'm going to be honest, when I, it's all said and done, I think it's going to be Sokoa. Solo Sokoa that's going to deliver that Samoan spike to Roman for the final nail in this coffin of the Tribal Chief. Well, guys, let's get into these final thoughts. What do we say? So, Night of Champions. Um, this pay-per-view went really fast for me. It went really quick. I enjoyed that, actually. It didn't feel like a drag. I never found that I was slow for action in this one. It did have its slow moments in the middle, right? We opened with, you know, the main event, um, the World Championship. It was what I thought was going to be the main event. And then we ended with a really good storytelling with the Bloodline. Let's talk about this triple main event business. This is marketing by the WWE, and it's a cover story for the World Championship. They didn't want to put the World Championship in the main event, so you know they basically said we gotta have a triple main event and market it a little different so that way everybody feels like there's three main events. I'm gonna say there's not three main events. The main event is the last match of the night. That's always the main event. That's why it's called a main event. Marketing. Don't fall for the marketing. All right? So, I will say, though, I did enjoy the world title match. Um, the Styles Clash never works in the WWE. You guys notice that. I'm going to tell you why. It's the little things that the WWE just loves to do. The Styles Clash was not a WWE move. That was the face that ran another place in TNA Impact Wrestling. And all across the indie scene, AJ Styles won all these matches with the Styles Clash. 
and we can't have that in WWE land. So, introduce the Phenomenal Forearm, which is a good move too, and it's fun. So, I just kinda would like to see when AJ Styles ever gets his big, giant moment that he wins something major, like a title of Mania or something with a Styles Clash. How cool would that be? So, the broadcast team, I wanna say, you know, good job to them tonight. Um, There's a couple things, they did a great job storytelling, adding value to the stories that guided us through the program, even the commercial breaks. I like the fact, and kudos to Corey Graves and Michael Cole for telling us, on Peacock Plus, we'll be staying for the preview, but if not, we'll be on the going to do a commercial. And it didn't feel as interrupted, and that's the things I've been critical on in the past, where I was like, what happened? I just got an entrance cut off, right? So I will say, I felt like they knew their audience and what their audience would be seeing, and they took us through the story and the journey as a commentating team should. So good job to them, the broadcasting team. Um, also, the commentary team. They mentioned Drew McIntyre in the Gunther match. Interesting. He's probably not as in danger of leaving the WWE as some reports may suggest because the WWE would not mention him on TV if that was the case. If you don't agree with me, see my point about Bray Wyatt. Also, I want to talk about my final thought. A missed opportunity to rebrand the championships. And that was the big thing tonight. The WWE missed a big opportunity. You were already introducing a new title in this World Heavyweight Championship. But why not stop there? Why not go ahead and rebrand the Raw and the SmackDown Women's Championships. Since you are doing this reshuffle and the draft has now clearly put the roster in place and those titles don't seem to be moving back to the respective brands of Raw and SmackDown. So my suggestion plea is this could have been a night where we rebranded the women's titles, the WWE title on one brand and the Divas Championship on the other. It doesn't have to be the Divas Championship of old, you guys. It could be simply a alternate another title on Raw and one on SmackDown. And that would have been great to see from the WWE. And they could have just done that all at Night of Champions when they were fresh off the draft and wanting to rebrand everything that they had. So guys, that's all my final thoughts. What are some of yours? Let me know in the comments below and give me the, that like. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. And like I always say, like, share, subscribe. Thank you for watching. And it's not goodbye around here, but it's game over.